Okay, so we were on this topic of standing for the last two times I've been teaching. Um, I hope most of you are here or, or you know what we've already talked about. I don't have time to in depth go into depth on, on that, but I do want to do a little bit of a recap. Uh, if you remember, we talked about the word stand and homonyms, which is basically a word that sounds the same, spelled the same, but has different meanings. And we probably picked out, I don't know, a dozen or more. I don't remember uh, places of, of the, you know, where stand was used in the scriptures, but it was used in a you know, with different definitions. And if you remember, we went to Psalm 1, where we saw that there was actually two different definitions used for the same word stand there. Um, when he said, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners. And we said that one meant to be joined in, like-minded, right? So you're not standing with them. They're not being like-minded. So you don't stand in the path of sinners. You don't sit in, the, sit in the seat of the scornful, but your delight is in the law of the Lord. And on it, you will meditate day and night. You shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water um, who brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaves shall never wither. And all that you do shall prosper, but the ungodly not so. They shall be driven away like the chaff by the wind, and they will not stand in the judgment nor in the congregation of the righteous. Right? So there you go. They're not going to persevere. That's what that stand means. They're not going to be able to stand against the judgment. So different, two different places. And then another one uh, we talked about and I said we would get back to was judge. To stand means to stand in judgment. It's used, used that way through the scriptures. We're going to be taking a look at that tonight. Uh, and actually, I entitled this, To Stand the Judgment. The first one was to stand the whole armor of God. The second one was to stand, let he who thinks he stands, you know, take heed lest he fall. Yeah. Um, so that was the second one. This one will be to stand the judgment. Um, and if you remember, we went to part one, obviously, was 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 13. It said, watch, stand fast, in the, stand fast in the faith, and be brave and be strong. And previously, before Paul, he's given this closing admonition to the Corinthians. Uh, he said that he was going to stay in Ephesus because a great and effective door had been opened to him. But... There are many adversaries, right? And so he said, you yeah, stand, watch, stand fast in the faith and be brave and be strong because there are many adversaries. We, we have got a lot of adversaries. And so now we have to not only put on the whole armor of God, but we have to take it up. So the difference would be, you know, just putting it on. That's not going to do a whole lot of good if you don't know how to use it, right? So you have to be able to put it on. You have to be able to take it up. It says that you uh, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and having done all to stand, to be able to persevere. And then part two in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, we keyed off on he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. And the example Paul was giving there was the example of Israel in the wilderness wandering and how they were caught up in idolatry, sexual immorality, murmuring, complaining, and all the things. And it says that God was not pleased with them and that he scattered them in the wilderness. And so we ended that kind of with, well, let's, let's take inventory of ourselves. How do, how do we compare? Because basically that's what he was getting at. Uh, Israel thought that because they were the, the children of God, that they had some special standing in God's you know, presence and, the, and that God would just be like, okay, I, he's indifferent to their sin and, and their murmuring and their sexual morality and all that. Well, not so. He judged them, right? And, he, and so what he's getting at is, you know, I, all these things were written for your admonition. Don't think that just because you call yourself Christian or you think you're Christian, if you're living a life like that, that you're going to escape God's judgment. All right. So that's kind of what he was getting at. And, uh, and then you remember at the end of that little text, it talked about being tempted. And he said that no temptation has come over you that is not common to man. Right. But that God will allow you to be tempted uh, but not to a point that you can't 
overcome it. You can't stand it, right? Um, so, and, and we said that God himself doesn't tempt. And I made that mistake because I said that. And then I said God tempted three times after that. Uh, so, so, no, God doesn't tempt. Uh, God does not tempt them, nor is God tempted. And we went into James and we talked about that, right? Each one is drawn away by their own evil desires. And when desire is conceived, it birth sin. And when sin grows up, guess what it does? It brings forth death, right? So God does not tempt, nor can God be tempted, but he will allow us to be tempted so that we can then learn to overcome that. He will provide a way of escape. And that was, that was what that meant. And basically, so you can't use temptation as an excuse for falling into sin, right? You can't go there because God won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you can endure. So if you don't endure it, it's because you didn't want to endure it. You, you made a conscious decision to step over that line. Okay. So that's where we were. That's, that actually section is going to come into play. We're going to kind of wrap around and bring this back in and knit this all back together. Um, So part one, basically, we must be well prepared to stand against the devil. And part two, uh, but we are not to be hypocritical and potentially placing ourselves under the judgment of God, in which we will certainly not stand, right? We can't stand against God's judgment. So part three, we're going to look at places in the scripture where Jesus stands, both Old Testament and New Testament. I thought that was interesting. I thought, well what happens when Jesus stands? And so I went through and I started looking around at, at, you know, places where Jesus stands and, and as like, you know, a lot of the definitions that we look at, a lot of the homonyms, some places he's just standing, you know, it doesn't really mean a whole lot, you know? So a few of them, um, he was walking along the way with a crowd of people and he came across two blind men and the blind men are calling out to him, calling out to him, calling out to him. And then it says, Jesus stood. And then he looked at them and he says, what do you want me to do for you? And they wanted to receive their sight and he healed them. So he stood when he did that. Uh, how about the last day, the last day of the great feast of tabernacles when Jesus stood up and he cried out to them and he said, I am the living. Let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink and anyone who believes on me out of him shall flow rivers of living water. So he stood up and he cried that out. Um, he stood in the midst of the disciples in the upper room, clearly says that they were there and he came and he stood among them. Uh, he stood by the seashore in Galilee. Remember when he said you were supposed to tarry in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And well, they did for a little while and then they decided, let's, let's go back to the old life, I suppose. And they went fishing back up in the Galilee, right? And, and Jesus had to go up there and it says that he stood by the seashore. Hey guys, you catching any, you know, it's, but he's not asking me that right now. <laughs> no, no, we're not catching any. <laughs> Stood by the seashore in the Galilee while the disciples were fishing. Um, the the yeah, no, we did not. We, well, we tried both sides. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> so the point uh, here is that we don't need to try to hyper spiritualize every instance in the Bible where Jesus is sitting or where he stands up. You know, we just don't need to do that. But there are certainly places and instances where we can read texts where um, either the, the Son of Man, Son of God, the Messiah in the Old Testament, or Jesus himself in the New Testament stands up and they have direct connotation. I mean, they, they're, <laughs> it's very clear what that means. And those are the ones that we're going to look at. So in the Jewish culture uh, of the day, and even, our, and even our culture of the day, usually when someone stood up, um, that, that kind of put them in a place of authority, right? They would stand up and, and that puts them in a place of authority and they were recognized as being in that place of authority. Uh, but when they sat down, that kind of put them, I mean, what would you think about that? If standing up was putting you, putting you in a place of authority, what would sitting down be doing? Submission. Or submission or, or yeah, or, you know, a, 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 a um, sense of community. You know, we're all together, right? We're sitting together, we're communing together, right? So, um, so now you're in Luke chapter six, right? Okay. And we're going to look at the sermon of the Mount. This is kind of interesting here. We're going to look at it in two different places here in Luke six and Matthew five. If you want to try to stick your finger in Matthew five real quick. 
In uh, Luke 6, verse 12, it says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles, Simon, who he also named Peter, Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from all the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits and they were healed and the whole multitude sought to touch him for power went out from him and healed them all. Then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, blessed are you, blessed are you poor for yours is the kingdom of God. So we're going to stop right there because right here it says he was up on a mountain. He was up on a high place in the mountain and he, and he was up there and he was praying all night to God. And then he sees the multitude and his disciples. He picks his 12 disciples, but he comes down and he stands in a, a level place. All right. Well, if you look at Matthew chapter five, the companion text to this in five, one to three, it says, in seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he came down from the mountain. And if you kind of try to put these together, you can, you can almost picture that he was up on a high place in the mountain. He was praying to God all night long. And then he came down to a level place where the multitude gathered with him and he was healing them. And he was, you know, curing them of the season, casting out demons and all that kind of thing. And then when his disciples finally came to him, he sat down to teach them. So he sat down almost in a, this kind of gives me a sense of, of community. He wasn't there in a, a maybe not a, I mean, he is authority, right? We, we recognize the authority that Jesus has, but he was kind of teaching them in a non-threatening community way. All right. Drawing them to them, bringing his people to him in a non-threatening way. And that's kind of the way I picture that. It wasn't really in a place of judgment and certainly not in a place of, uh, you know, a threatening place. It was more of a place, a non-threatening place of acceptance. Family. Kind of like the family, yeah. Um, but for the case of judgment that I want to talk about here, I want to contrast some specific differences between what the scriptures say about when Jesus is sitting and when he rises to stand. And that's what we're going to pull out. Um, you'll note that God is the God. The father is the he's the federal head, right? He is the authority and he sits on his throne. OK, he has delegated judgment to to the son, Jesus, who is where? On his right hand, seated at his right hand. Right. So he's delegated judgment to Jesus. And when Jesus the Messiah, the Son of Man, however, what do you want to call him? When he rises from his seat, yeah, uh oh, <laughs> rut row, when Jesus rises from his seat, um, it's in judgment. He's coming, he's coming. There's a very clear, definite meaning there. And, and let me tell you that the Jewish people, and particularly the ruling class, they knew this. This wasn't something that was foreign to them. They knew that when the Messiah stood, that there was judgment coming. All right. And so here's what we're going to look at. And but we're going to get there. But first off, just to develop the story, we already asked it. Where's Jesus now? Right hand. And what is he doing? He's sitting down. Right. So very clear. He's sitting down. Our creed. If you remember our creed. I believe in God, the father almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. Come on. You guys know we do it every week. <laughs> God, the father almighty maker of heaven and earth. Is only who was of the Holy spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died and was buried. He descended into Hades. The day he rose again and is seated at the right hand of God, the father almighty. Okay. And from there, and that's the big one from there. What does that imply? 
From there, he's going to judge the living and the dead. When the from there is like he's sitting down at the right hand of God the Father, from there, he will judge the living and dead. He's coming again to judge the living and the dead. Now, this is not scripture. But let me tell you, it's very accurate. It's very scripturally based, and you can pick out all kinds of scriptures, and you can support everything that is said in the creed. It's not scripture, but it's extremely accurate and very, you know, obviously scripturally based. Um, so Colossians 3.1 says, If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. He's sitting at the right hand of God. So, we'll, you know, we're going to emphasize this just to let you know. Um, Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for, for whom for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Clearly, Jesus is sitting. So, uh, flip over to Psalm 2. We're going to take a look at Psalm 2 real quick, and I'll let you go there, because we're going to go through this. We're going to actually look at several Psalms. 2, 110, and 68, portions of these anyway, so... Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations rage? And the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven shall laugh. Now, that's not kind of like a mocking laugh. That's kind of like, I mean, think about, think about if, um, you know, the, you're, you're the lone world superpower, you know, and no, there's nobody on the planet that can challenge you. And then, well, I don't know, let's say Jamaica, you know, says, hey, we're going to invade you, U.S. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, kind of that kind of laugh, right? Really? You know, so yeah, let's, let's break their bonds and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. <laughs> really? You really think you're going to do this? The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then. So there's a sit and there's a then. And I'm going to suggest that the then means somebody stands up. Okay? Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep his displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth, your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled, kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So he sits, he's going to stand. And it's clearly the son that's going to do the judging there in Psalm 2. Psalm 110 is a psalm of David. If you want to try to get there real quick. Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verses 1 to 7. It says, a psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Till. Sit until. So something's going to happen at the until, right? <laughs> sit until. Okay, sit until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the, beauty, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the days of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. There shall, therefore, he shall lift up the head. Clearly, he's going to stand and he's going to execute judgment when he stands. He's going to execute them 
on basically the ungodly earth. 68, Psalm 68. Actually, turn to this one uh, because this one is going to, again, be one that we're going we're gonna to kind of knit back into the, the whole picture here. Psalm 68. And I want you to think about these next couple ones, Psalm 68, and then we're going to end up, we're going to go at the first part, Isaiah 3. And, and these are the ones that really, you know, if you're a ruling elder or, you know, Pharisee, Sadducee, Sadducee in Israel, these are, these are texts that you know in your head and you know the, you know the very specific meaning of what they are. Psalm 68 says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, a song, let God arise. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those also who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. So when he stands in judgment, the unrighteous are going to be scattered and they're going to wither before him. But the righteous, not so. The righteous are going to rejoice, exceedingly rejoice. Right? Okay, that's what it says, right? Now, Isaiah chapter 3, in verse 13, it says, The Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes. Let me repeat that. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes. Who's he judging here? The leadership. He's judging the leadership of Israel. He's going to stand in judgment against the leadership of Israel. That's what this says. Isaiah 3, the Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and with his princes. Okay, so you got a pretty good idea now, right? Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father. That's where he is right now. One day he's going to stand. And when he stands, he's going to stand in judgment. So I want to show you something else here in Luke chapter four. I shouldn't have had you move so far away from that because it was only a couple of pages back from where you were earlier. You remember um, before Jesus starts his ministry, he goes out and he fasts for 40 days and then he comes back and he's tempted by the devil, Right. And then after he goes through the temptation of the devil, he goes back up to Galilee and he starts his public ministry. All right. So that's where we're at. In Luke four, verse 16 it says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read a place of authority. He stood up to read. But it's very interesting. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, just coincidentally. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to claim liberty to the captives and recover and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. It's very interesting. And then all the eyes of the people in the synagogue were fixed on him. You got to wonder, wonder what they were thinking. You got to wonder what they were thinking. There's a lot of different things you could think that why they might be thinking this and their eyes were fixed on, fixed on. One of them is he didn't finish the verse. Okay. He read that part, closes it, hands it back, and he sits down. All eyes are fixed on him, and then he says, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. 
He basically told him, I'm your Messiah. I'm the one that has come. I am the Messiah that has come. Now you got to imagine what they were thinking like about this, right? But again, he didn't finish the text. He stopped and then he sat down. So in Isaiah 61, 1 to 3, where he actually read from, it says, The spirit of the, the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he sits. And the next thing in the verse is, and the day of vengeance of God. He sat down. He's going to stand back up. Right now, he's sitting down. He was sitting down in a place. I am your Messiah. I have come to heal you. I've come to you know, care for you. I've come to, you know, to proclaim all these things. He sits down, but then he's going to stand. And it says, and the, and the day of vengeance of God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now, I want you to get the implications that are here, because there's some pretty big implications. Um, he's, going to, he's going to stand back out, stand back up. And when he stands back up, wrath is going to be poured out very clearly. The vengeance of God is going to be poured back out when poured out when he stands up. But part of the other thing that's accomplished here is he's going to comfort all who mourn, console the mourning in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now, I want to suggest to you that when he stands up to judge, which he is going to stand up to judge, not only is he going to judge an unrighteous and ungodly world, he's also judging Israel, but the purpose of the judgment of Israel is to draw them back. He wants to restore Israel. So it says he's going to stand up. He's going to judge to comfort all who mourn. All right. And what does the scripture tell us on the day of atonement? When the ultimate day of atonement is fulfilled, it says Israel look upon him who they have pierced and they will mourn. He's going to stand up and judge. But part of the purpose of that judgment is to then draw Israel back. And he is going to restore them. He's going to give them beauty for ashes and restoration. That is going to be the fulfillment of the day of atonement. All right. You got that? Now, the day of atonement, the fulfillment of the, the, the prophetic day of atonement, is accomplished by God pouring out his wrath. He's pouring out his wrath when? The, 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 the tribulation. Daniel 70th 7, right? So he's going to pour out his wrath during the 70th 7 of Daniel. During the tribulation. What happens after the tribulation? He physically comes back to earth with his saints he establishes his millennial kingdom. Righteousness and peace will reign. And what's he doing? He's sitting down on the throne of David. How about that? Peace, community, righteousness. He stands in judgment. He draws them back. He restores Israel from a place of mourning and, and separation from God. And then he comes back and he sits down. He establishes his righteous millennial kingdom. Sits on the throne of David. That's what he's going to do. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's, just, it's just so cool. So, so now, if I haven't convinced you quite yet, turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. John's caught up into the throne room and he's seeing all these things and he writes them down. And when you get to chapter 5 of Revelation, John says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, who's that? That's God the Father. 
Yeah. I saw, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to even look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and, the, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Jesus is standing. He's taking the scroll when he stands. Stood a lamb as though he had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a, sharp, a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made us kings and princes to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive power, riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. The lamb stood. He takes the throne. He takes the scroll. He's going to open those scrolls starting in there, that scroll in the next chapter. And then judgment begins to be executed. And from then on, from chapter 6 to 19, the wrath of God is poured out on an ungodly earth from the Lamb who is standing in judgment. But what happened at the end of that section? They sang a new song you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. And you, for you were slain and have redeemed the God to, us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made us kings and princes to our God and we shall reign on earth. And then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. And they were saying with a loud voice, worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing in every creature which is under heaven and on earth and under the earth and all that are such in the sea and all of them are heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And we just read in Psalm 68 that he's going to cast his judgment upon the unbelieving ungodly world. But the righteous, they will rejoice. They will rejoice exceedingly. And they're going to say, blessing to you, God. You are righteous and your judgment is righteous. And they're going to rejoice exceedingly because finally, finally, righteousness was going to reign. Isn't that neat? How that ties right back into Psalm 68. So now I want to go to another text. Acts chapter 7. I found this to be a little bit interesting. A little bit interesting. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, right? In Acts chapter 7, Stephen says something. He says, I saw Jesus standing. 
and and very very it's very traditional, very common for the church, and the church has embraced that basically what they're saying is that Jesus Stephen was being stoned, and 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 Jesus stands to receive his saints. We've heard that before, right? It's very common. It's a very common teaching among the church that. Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father. He's not going to stand again until he's ready to judge. But except for when one of his saints is going to come home, Jesus stands to receive. Right? That's what we've been told. I want to show you something here. Okay? Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, but Jesus saw him standing at the right hand of God the Father. And, and, and in this text, you're also going to see the, the players in this. We got Stephen, we got the ruling class, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And, and then we have one particular individual that's standing and watching all this happen. Except for he was then Saul, Saul not Paul yet, right? And he was Saul. And I think Paul was really, really affected by this later as after he gets saved by this specific event. I think it really was. And in fact, I want to suggest to you that if you go back to 1 Corinthians 10, where we talked about, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. I think Paul remembered this because he rehearsed all that was going on with Israel in the wilderness wandering, right? He was doing that to the Corinthian church. Remember them? This, was, this all happened for your admonition. This wasn't just by coincidence. This was for your admonition. Just remember what they did. You know, they, they came to Mount Zion and, and they were going to receive the law and they stood before Moses and they said, "All you go, you go. All that God says, we will do. We're going to do anything he says. We got it. We're going to do. And the next thing you find them doing is making the golden calf. They're in idolatry. They can't even wait till, till Moses comes back for that short period of time. And then we find them in sexual immorality. We find them complaining and murmuring against God. Over and over and over we find all these things and it says because of that, they fell in the, in, in, in the wilderness. Because of their doubt, because of their unbelief, it tells us that in Hebrews chapter 3. He, they were judged in the wilderness. Not one of that generation left the wilderness and went into the promised land because of doubt and unbelief, except for two. Yep, except for two, Caleb and Joshua. Uh, none, of, none of the rest of them, basically the rest of that generation perished in the wilderness. And it was because of their doubt and their unbelief and all that they, and, and Paul said, take heed, take heed lest you fall to these things. Now you got to think about what was going on in his mind when he watched this event happen with Stephen because he watched it and he remembered. And I think that's why he was saying this because what was happening? Stephen is standing before the ruling class and he's rehearsing the exact same thing. Israel's wandering to, they, you know, the whole history of them. They come out of the wilderness they're wandering to the wilderness. They claim, they, they complain, they murmur, they, everything again, they're idolatrous, the sexual immorality, all these things that they were doing. Right. And then he says, he says, and on top of that, your fathers, they stoned, are they not stoned? They, they killed, persecuted and killed all the prophets who proclaimed the coming of the just one. That's what he was telling them. It's the same thing. And then he says, you're doing, you are doing the very same thing. Now check this out. Acts 7 51, verse 51, We're gonna, I'm going to cut it short. I'm not going to go to the whole thing. We'll pick it up in verse 51. He says, and you stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Excuse me. I'm sorry. It started in 51. Okay, 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did also. You do. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers. You have received the law by the direction, direction of the angels and have not kept it. And then it says in 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart 
and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Oh, they were mad. Oh, they were mad. Are you telling us this thing? We're, we are that. We're the same. Oh, he, they were mad. Mad, mad. But they didn't do anything yet. Then, in 55, it says, But he, Stephen, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, and it's a good thing, he had to be full of the Holy Spirit to do what he was about to do. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the wilderness and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, I told you all those scriptures where the Son of Man was going to stand and he was going to judge in the Old Testament, which they would have known very well, particularly Isaiah 3, when it said he's going to stand and judge his own people, the ruling class of Israel. The Son of Man is going to stand. And I'm going to tell you that when Stephen said, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He wasn't because he was about to be received. It was because he just said, he's coming to judge you. He is standing in judgment against you, and you will be judged for what you have done. Just like Israel in the wilderness was judged because they completely disregarded God. They didn't care about him. They didn't know what he was. They were complaining, murmuring, caught up in idolatry, sexual immorality, complaining, everything that they were doing. Just like them. Just like them. Just like your fathers before you persecuted and killed the prophets who proclaimed the coming of the just one. Guess what you did? You not only missed him, you killed him. And now I see him standing. And he's coming to judge you. If you look at the order of the text, it wasn't that they were stoning him and then he saw. He said, I see him. And then they drove him out of town and then they stoned him. It makes much more sense. It makes much, much more sense that he told them that God was going to stand in judgment against them. And he will. He will. For the purpose of drawing them back so that then all Israel shall be saved. That's what he said in Romans, right? That's the purpose of that. So we're going to wind up. Psalm 1. Back at Psalm 1. Now I've got to turn there. We've already gone through that. We have to evaluate ourselves. We have to make sure that we're not being like-minded with the sinners, right? Not standing in the path of the sinners. Romans chapter 1, we like to look at those texts, those several texts, those, particularly those three things, right? Um, first off, we had a sexual revolution, and then we had a homosexual revolution, and then he gave them over to a reprobate minds. And, and we have to remember that if you keep going through the rest of that text to the end of the, cha end of the chapter, there's a whole lot more sins that are listed there. Right? That I'm certain, quite certain, that every one of us could look at and go, hmm, hmm, hmm. None of which shall, by the way, inherit the kingdom. Right? So we have to be real careful. And it says, so, so be careful that you don't judge because you could be bringing judgment on yourself. So now, if your sins have been forgiven, if, if, if Jesus has covered you, he's covered you. But again, you don't want to self-deceive yourself into thinking that you're okay just because you call yourself Christian because as Paul said, take heed lest you fall, right? 
You've got to make sure you actually have that breastplate of righteousness on, that it's not just that facade of a breastplate of righteousness. So it also tells us when he goes on into Roman, yeah, Romans chapter 2 that God gave us a conscience. And our conscience is going to either accuse us or it's going to excuse us. So that's going to be the big tormentor, I think, in hell. Your conscience. When it, complete, when it continually accuses you over and over and over and over. When you knew the righteousness of God. Because it says they did know the righteousness of God. In verse 15 of Romans chapter 2, it says, Who show the work of law written in, written in their hearts, their conscience also bear, bearing witness, and between themselves and their thoughts accusing or excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. So there's going to be a day when God, through Jesus Christ, is going to judge the secrets of men. And we need to take a self-evaluation of ourselves and make sure our secret places are clean. <laughs> okay? As, as Pastor Ritz been saying, need to get that outward, outward person and that inward person aligned. You know, our, who we are in public and who we are in private. They need to come into alignment. Because they're going to be judged. And it tells us in Revelation chapter 20 at the end, the great white throne judgment of God, it says all people are going to come before the throne. And God's going to open the books. And he's going to judge. And all those who are not found in the Lamb's book, what happens to them? They're cast away. They will be cast away into outer darkness. They will not stand. But the righteous, they will stand. And they will be exceedingly glad. Psalm 24 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart and has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor has sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That's where we want to be. We want to be those people who can ascend the holy hill of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to close there, and Terry is going to close us with a song. <laughs>